In the four years that CloudFront's been around, we've had the chance to work with many, many customers from startups to enterprises. And specifically for this audience, uh, many, many video streaming solutions. And during that time, uh, we've had a chance to learn and understand how our video solution provider customers view performance experience and how they measure it for their customers. We've also had the opportunity to work with them on troubleshooting any performance issues that their customers might be experiencing. And as a result, I'm here to present uh, 12 specific best practices that come from that collective experience, from the collective experience of the customers that we've worked with as a, a content delivery network solution provider, as well as some best practices from Amazon video solutions that exist today. And if you're here, it's because you know that the video performance your customers experience is critically important to them, and it's critically important to your business. E-commerce providers know this as well. Uh, there have been many case studies that, that can link the cost of slow performance to their bottom line revenues. And in this one example, uh, we see that one second can have as much as a 7% negative impact on revenue. And performance matters to video customers as well. Poor performance and video interruptions lead to less return traffic and less, less video viewed overall. IMDB, of course, knows this very well. Uh, their operations team is constantly using their performance measurement, their metrics, and dashboards to find issues with their infrastructure or find problems their customers are experience, experiencing, pinpointing those issues, and finally fixing them. And ultimately, that's what performance measurement is all about. It's about improving the streaming performance of your customers by first finding those issues and then fixing them. That means defining the right measurements up front, uh, finding ways to collect that measurement data and get it back into your own systems so that they can be analyzed and you can slice the data up and find the specific failures that may be happening in your system that lead to that poor performance. All right, so we start with uh, guideline number one. You have to start with your customers. If you don't know what your customers care about, you won't be able to measure it. So you need to know what they're watching, where they're watching it from, how frequently they're watching it. And depending on who your customers are, you may care about different performance criteria. For example, if you're vending feature-length films, you may care a lot more about ensuring that customers get a high-quality stream that's uninterrupted. And in fact, you may be willing to sacrifice a little bit of startup latency in order to achieve an uninterrupted stream. Whereas if you're a website that's providing uh, clips of cat videos, you may prioritize that startup latency and may be willing to sacrifice a little bit of that video quality. Once we know who our customers are and how they're using our video, it's important to identify those critical customer vital signs those three or four key metrics that matter most to your customer. And we need to think about them as distinct and separate from diagnostic measurements. Diagnostic metrics are important to understanding the nature of the problem and getting to root cause, but we'll have hundreds of them, and if we allow them to pollute or get in the way of, of those key customer metrics, then we will lose, lose clear signal. So make sure you're identifying those customer vital signs and keeping them distinct from the diagnostic metrics. As I talked to a number of the video customers that we worked with, uh, when it came to video, there were really three key customer metrics that stood out. Job one is availability, uh, and also the second most important metric I found was uh, ensuring that there is an uninterrupted stream experience, and finally, visual quality was a uh, very important to my customers' customers. When it comes to availability, if customers can't get to your content, then your performance measurement or how fast or rebuffering doesn't really matter. The tricky part about availability is that it, it can be difficult to measure something that didn't happen. If customers didn't get to your service, how do you know? This graph is uh, some real-world data taken from one of the customers that we work with, and it illustrates the number of concurrent sessions that they see and actually covers 
a uh, little bit more than three days. And if you look at this graph, it's clear that there are some, uh, there's some very clear patterns that emerge. You can see that on our weekday, the, the weekday traffic for this customer tends to see a peak around lunchtime and another peak in the evening. And then our evening traffic, those spikes toward the right of the graph, show that there isn't really a lunchtime peak, but there is an evening spike. So now, if we were to come in and look at the second example, we see that our first weekend day is missing that typical peak. This would be a clear indicator that something is wrong, that some subset of customers may no longer be able to access our server. This could alert us to an availability problem our customers are experiencing. Customers also want uninterrupted playback. The most common method I saw for measuring uninterrupted playback was by uh, calculating rebuffering events and then coming up with a way to mark individual user sessions as having experienced or not experienced rebuffering. With that metric, you can plot it over time, and you can calculate a percentage of your total sessions that experience any amount of rebuffering. With this metric, we can see spikes or anomalies that, again, would alert us to maybe a specific problem with one of our servers or network congestion that may be leading to those rebuffering events and video interruption. And finally, visual quality. And although I, I have to go full disclosure here, this is a made-up graph. I wasn't actually able to get my hands on a good graph that represented the visual quality that customers are experiencing. Even though all the customers I talked to said this was important to their viewers, uh, it's a very difficult to, to measure. I think, in theory, it should be possible to know what the maximum potential of a particular video client on a network is and know what your best quality video is, and then mark a particular session as having achieved that maximum potential or not. Um, as it turns out, it sounds like that's more difficult to achieve than, than the people I talked to were able to come up with. But what I did learn was interesting is they still fall back to direct user feedback. So uh, my customers pay a lot of attention to feedback buttons. Uh, they often, their, their clients or players will give their customers the ability to say, yes, this stream was good, or no, it wasn't. And that can really clue them in to potential visual quality issues in their system. I've also heard about the possibility of abandonment rates. Uh, in theory, it should be possible to look at a particular stream and detect whether or not a user left early. Uh, and that can be correlated with any other events that might be happening in your system. And again, could be a clue that visual quality is suffering in some way. All right, so once we've defined our clear customer vital signs, we've identified those two or three key metrics that are most important to our viewers, it's time to develop systems that can collect that measurement information. And in my research, I found there are really three broad categories of collecting that metric information. You can get it from your service side, from your infrastructure itself, from server logs. You can get it using an external measurement methodology which uses uh, vendors that have measurement agents located around the world connecting back into your service infrastructure. Or you can develop methods to extract real user measurements from the video clients themselves. If we look at these three different me measurement methodologies, we can size them up and evaluate them against one another on how well they represent and measure the customer experience, how easy they are to use, and how good the diagnostic information is that each of these methods provide. Diagnostic information being the measurements that will clue you into the root cause of any particular customer impacting issue. Let's look at server-side monitoring. So as I said, server-side monitoring is the monitoring that comes straight off of your infrastructure. This can take the form of your actual web access logs. Uh, it can be server utilization metrics like memory consumption or CPU utilization. Uh, those things tend to be diagnostic measurements. One of my favorites is actually first byte latency. It measures, it's, it, it's a measurement that comes off of the server and separates performance issues that may exist in the network from those that exist on the server infrastructure itself. Now while it's possible to use these low level metrics to divine the actual end user customer experience, in practice, it's very difficult. And it, it's 
nearly impossible to understand whether or not a user experienced any video interruption as a result of something that may have been happening on your server. So for that reason, server-side monitoring methodologies relative to others get about a C plus in their ability to measure that customer experience. But there are a lot of solutions available today, so in terms of ease of management, it's not too bad. It's fairly straightforward to get set up. And in terms of diagnostic data, it tends to be very, very valuable. So ensure, I would say you should include server-side monitoring in your measurement package, but think of it more in the diagnostic camp. Next, we come to external monitoring. External monitoring is based on uh, automated agents that are simulating your clients or viewers by uh, the browsers or clients they're using, making requests against your video content, downloading it, taking measurements. Oftentimes, these monitoring agents are distributed around the world. It's not typical, or I should say, it's typical to see monitoring solutions that give you 30 to even 100 different measurement points globally. However, it's important to note that, that external monitoring agents rely on a simulation of user request traffic. It's not, it doesn't measure exactly what the users are experiencing. And I, I'll walk you through a specific uh, use case that demonstrates this. So most of your content distribution solutions, your servers, and all of the infrastructure you rely on to deliver video to your customers often relies on caching to deliver better and better performance. So uh, as a result, the performance that any one user experiences will depend on the usage that other users, uh, depend on the usage of other users. I'll, I'll dive into a really simple example here. So in this case, we have a video client that's making a request to your video content. And I've highlighted two such systems that rely on caching to deliver performance, our DNS layer and a CDN cache. The first user would go to look up your video content, videos.amazon.com, goes to the DNS servers to get translated into an address that the client can use to connect to your server. Now, in a, in a missed scenario, that user may experience 100 milliseconds of latency, which may not seem like a lot, uh, but can be, depending on how many DNS requests are required to facilitate that initial uh, connection. And it is something to be aware of. The second request goes for the content itself, in this case, our cat video, uh, and we get connected to the CDN cache, but the CDN doesn't have that content in its memory. So it has to go all the way back to the origin to get the content. And as, as a consequence, that first user request will pay a little bit more uh, penalty in terms of that total download time. The second request gets the benefit of that prime cache. So our DNS lookups are almost instantaneous. The CDN cache is prime, so we don't have to go all the way back to the origin server, and we deliver a very fast experience, right? So the performance that your users experience depends on the usage, the use of other, the volume of traffic from other users. And of course, it also depends on location. Where are users connecting from? Where's the content? If the content is more closely located to users on the West Coast, in this example, they're going to get a better experience than users on the East Coast. And the reality is that these effects play off of one another. So it's not just, it's the, the amount of usage that's coming from a particular region going to a particular resource. So users on the West Coast are priming the caches on the West Coast, but may not be priming the caches on the East Coast. It's very complicated and difficult to measure if you're trying to build those external monitoring agents. The other artifact or bias that can happen with external monitoring agents you need to be aware of is that monitoring agents are running in data centers. And sometimes those monitoring agents are running in the same data centers that are serving your content, either your CDN solution or your server infrastructure. As a consequence, some monitoring agents get very good connection times. They're connected directly into the same backbones used by those content providers. But your customers are not accessing the internet through data centers most of the time. Uh, in this case, your users may be many hops away from the backbone and from those data centers, and, and they're going to see very different latencies than what those measurement agents might. So for that reason, relative to other measurement methodologies, the customer experience 
So it's rated at a, about a C. Uh, it does a better job than the server-side monitoring because it does take care of the geolocation. And some external solutions are actually pretty good about running from viewer networks as opposed to data centers. But still, simulating the volumes and all of the diversity of the interactions that happen is something that the mon external monitoring agents don't do a great job of. They do tend to be relatively easy to set up and manage. And they do provide really good diagnostic information. So with these, with these monitoring agents, you may be able to pinpoint a specific portion of your infrastructure that isn't performing or isn't working the way you would expect it to in a way that other measurement methodologies may not. All right, third is our real user monitoring measurement collection methodology. Real user monitoring works by taking telemetry straight off of the video clients as your viewers are watching videos. We're able to get really good data on any kind of video interruption because the client's aware of what's happening. And all of that great metric data is pushed up into a central API of some sort for further processing and aggregation. We don't have to worry about making sure that we're not connected into the backbone or that we're too close to those data centers because we're operating from exactly where your viewers are. For that reason, the real user monitoring is capable of, of getting a really great view of what's happening from a customer experience perspective. Now, one of the downsides tends to be that you get a lot of data from a lot of different places, and you may be subject to more outliers on those data sets. Uh, and so for those reasons, the ease of management isn't quite as good as the other ones. I give it a C plus. There are some solution providers that do make this pretty easy for you. If you're rolling your own solution, you have to take a lot of care in how you collect those measurements and how you segment the data to ensure that you're getting those useful insights and you can see what's happening with your customers. And in terms of diagnostic data, uh, real user measurement, especially for video clients, are capable of surfacing up really great information. If you want to know what specific problem a particular client is having, real user measurement can surface that for you. All right, so to sum it all up, guideline number three, use service-side and external measuring primarily as a source for diagnostics data. And if you can, tap into your video clients and leverage real user data to track the experience that your viewers are seeing. So we've got our definition. We know how to measure our customers' experience. We've selected a number of methodologies for collecting that data. Now it's time to take all of that data we're receiving and slice it up so that we can pinpoint problems in our system and ultimately find ways to fix, fix what may be happening for our customers. When it comes to analyzing your data, there are two things that I look for. I want to ensure that our solutions are highly visible and what I mean by that is it should be obvious and apparent when something is going wrong. Much like that drop in availability that we looked at earlier, that graph that showed a big hole where we should have seen a spike. So highly visible is important. It also needs to be actionable. We need to segment our data in a way that tells us that there's a problem in our server versus the network, versus any number of other components that may contribute to poor performance. One of the best first ways to do that is by segmenting your data. Of the customers I talked to, these were the four most common methods for segmenting up customer and viewer experience data. Geographic regions are, one of the, uh, are a great place to start. Almost everybody I talked to, or actually everybody I talked to uses this. And it, it can be a great place to understand exactly where a particular problem might be. I've got a specific example here. So again, this is some real world data. This is a plot of number of concurrent sessions, but it's done from a global view. So this is all of the concurrent sessions worldwide for this service. If we split that out very simply just by three different regions, you can see very different patterns emerge out of that graph. We start to see the day versus night pattern for the different regions. And I'll also call out that circle is highlighting a drop in concurrent sessions that wasn't visible at all in our global view. And a drop like that it should raise alarms inside your operations organization. It means there may be a problem going on. We see these kinds of drops when major network events happen. In this case, 
it's possible that some sub-oceanic network connection or cable actually broke, and suddenly a large population of users are no longer able to access your content. With a graph like this, we can quickly be clued into that possibility, and we might go check some internet boards to see if any major network events have happened. When it comes to video, the clients your viewers are using are very important. And different clients may experience or exhibit different behaviors and could be a contributing factor to poor performance. I was working with a customer earlier this year that came to us uh, saying that, that we were having poor performance, so they were experiencing poor performance on our product. Going in the next layer, we noticed a high number of cache misses coming from for their distribution. When we dug into the data, one of the first things we did was split it up by client and device. And when we did that, it became immediately obvious. There was one specific client that was contributing to the vast majority of cache misses this customer was experiencing. And of course, as you know, with cache misses comes worse performance. With that data, we were able to adapt our system and work around the behavior that this particular client was exhibiting that was preventing us from caching the files at our edge locations. A number of our uh, video customers leverage a multi-CDN solution. And if you're leveraging, a, and different CDNs can perform better or worse over time or better or worse for users in specific regions. If you're using a multi-CDN solution, I would encourage you to measure those CDNs and segment your performance data by CDN. I've got an example graph here. This is from Amazon.com. Uh, they do this very thing. They're using a three CDN solution, and they're always watching the performance of their CDNs. With this graph, they're able to identify one particular CDN that may not be working as well as another, and if they choose, they can reach out to that CDN and understand what's going on and troubleshoot the issue. They also have the option to shift their traffic around and allocate more traffic to the CDN that's providing the best performance for them. And finally, viewer networks. Last but not least, uh, when I was talking to our customers, it became clear that viewer network performance was one of the, the biggest contributors to poor video experience and to interruptions. And what can happen is on a, on a normal day, your viewer networks may be working fine and can provide all the capacity that they need to access everything on the internet. But perhaps at peak usage times, some specific internet service provider networks, those client networks, become congested and they aren't able to keep up with customer demand. And in such cases, your customers are going to start experiencing video interruptions and delays in getting their, their data. Excuse me. So a, a, ne a view of network segmentation can clue you into those specific issues and help you identify a particular network that may be misbehaving or may be overcongested. The trouble is that as of today, there are more than 42,000 different networks on the internet. And 42,000 is a number that doesn't graph very well, or at least you could graph it, but no human could interpret the results effectively. And that brings us to guideline number six. Use sorted lists for very diverse segments. And now we can take a look at our viewer network segment again. And that 42,000 list, we don't need to deal with all 42,000. We only need to deal with the top worst ones, perhaps the top, top 10 worst performing viewer networks. A list might look something like this. We can track our rebuffering events by viewer network, sorted by the most buffering events, and we can be clued into a specific customer network or viewer network that may be performing poorly. Uh, this, by the way, is graphable, so we can trend this over time, and we can see how maybe a specific worst offender is getting better or worse over time. Uh, with this data, you can go back to your CDN, uh, and potentially they can engage with that viewer network and find out if there may be ways to improve the connectivity between your content and that viewer network to prevent these customer impacts. Another important segmentation scheme that works particularly well for sorted lists is the content itself, sorting by video. PBS uses this method, and on a daily basis, they create a, a sorted list of streaming errors by video. 
and they use that to identify uh, potential corruption in their video file or problems with their encoding. And they're able to re-encode and push that file out and fix any issues in their system. And finally, we can revisit our client device lists and, and extend that with uh, much more information, like the specific version of a client, or maybe a client on a specific operating system, or mobile versus PC. And we can create a very complex matrix, but using the sorted worst offender list, we can zero in and identify maybe a particularly bad version of a client and inform our customers to upgrade immediately if there are issues there. OK, so as we've sorted or start segmenting our data and trim it down further and further, we do a much better job of zeroing in on exactly what may be going wrong and what may be contributing to a poor experience. As we do that, we become more susceptible to false positives in our data. And as an example, this is, a, this is made up data, uh, but I have a, a percentage of sessions rebuffering. So it's kind of like an error rate graph. And as we go along, we suddenly get a very large spike well, it's, it's hard to know if that's a real spike and if that 50% error means, well, 50% of our system is, is really causing an issue, or if maybe a very small number of concurrent sessions are contributing to that error rate. And in this case, this actually is happening uh, at a low time, and maybe we only have one or two concurrent sessions, in which case one of two concurrent sessions is causing a problem, causing a very, like an over-elevated error rate. Uh, the best way that... I know of to guard against that is to build graphs just like this to ensure that you have your, your rate graph, but that you're also plotting your denominator so that when you go to those low usage rates, you're not uh, overreacting to those false positive signals. That being said, false positives will still happen. This is some real data. Oh, sorry, this is uh, also a made-up scenario, but <laughs> real data in the graph. Uh, last, not long ago, the CloudFront operations team was alerted to a big drop in the number of concurrent sessions we were seeing in the European region. So our European ed edge locations saw like a 10 to 12 percent drop off in, in traffic. And of course, we immediately engaged. We started digging into the data. Uh, after 10 minutes of looking at some of our diagnostics, we couldn't correlate any problems on our system with that drop off. A little bit later, or moments later, somebody realized that the drop-off correlated exactly with the beginning of the World Cup final match. So it simply was that the European population stopped browsing the internet, started watching football, and uh, that tr triggered our alarms, but wasn't actually indicating a problem with our system. So just be prepared for that. False positives will, be, will happen as you segment further and further. So now that we've been able to zero in on the, on the clear areas, the regions, the clients, the devices, the viewer networks that may be contributing to uh, poor viewer experience, it's important to, to marry that with better and better and better diagnostic data. So step eight, I'd say go crazy with collecting your diagnostic data. Get it from your servers, get it from your CDN, get it from your video client. I've highlighted a couple of uh, useful metri metrics on the web server side. I already talked about first byte latency. Again, I, I like it a lot because it, it isolates the external network and client behaviors from what's happening on the server. And it, but it does encapsulate all of the processing that your server has to do before it starts pushing data back to your client. Of course, capture and keep CPU utilization and a lot of information that can clue you into overutilization of your resources. On the CDN side, make sure you're getting access to your hit and miss data. That's really important to understanding whether or not uh, poor performance is a result of problems in the system or maybe a result of a cache miss. Also, uh, grab errors, and if you're using a CDN, this is a great source for your request volumes. So this could feed into your availability graph. On the video client itself, since a lot of time is spent troubleshooting viewer networks and CDNs, uh, as a CDN, there are a couple things that are really useful for isolating and diagnosing uh, poor performance on a, on a particular client's machine. One of them is understanding that DNS lookup time and separating that from actually fetching the content. Uh, the connection time itself, literally before we really even request data, just the time it takes to connect 
to the CDN servers gives us a measurement that tells us how far away that client may be and can clue us into misrouting. So maybe that video, that particular video client is getting sent to an edge location that's much further away than it should have been. And separating that from the throughput measurement can clue us into issues if we're seeing, actually we're seeing really good latencies, that low latency connect time, but we're seeing poor throughput. That may be an indicator of that network congestion, potentially on the viewer network side. And please don't forget the logs. Logs are critically important. Uh, extending a little further, the things that help us in troubleshooting on the CDN side, knowing what the specific client IP is of a session that was seeing poor performance, and the DNS resolver that that client used to make the connection. A lot of CDNs, and CloudFront included, use the DNS resolver to route the user to the closest edge location. And without having that DNS resolver information, it can uh, require a little bit more effort on our part to figure out what may have gone wrong. Uh, to that end, HTTP headers are extremely useful. If your video client is capable of logging the HTTP response headers that come from the CDN you're using, oftentimes we can use that data to link up directly with the access logs and server logs on our side so we can pinpoint exactly what may have gone wrong with that request. And of course, getting client-side errors are extremely useful. The clients may see events that the server side doesn't, doesn't see, and by capturing them, logging them, and keeping them with the full request, we can uh, get some further insights. And by the way, just as a, a quick plug, S3 is a great, cheap solution for storing lots and lots of log data. It's actually what we use at CloudFront. All right, so we've got all of our measurement metrics identified, our segmentation schemes, uh, we've got our logs, we're ready to find and fix issues. The best way that I know of doing that is by creating a really great ops dashboard. I love a good ops dashboard. When they're built right, I can literally use just a web browser and look through graphs and recognize patterns and correlate them with diagnostic metrics and pinpoint a particular failure that may be happening and contributing to poor experience. It works with a, a really great start page that begins with those customer vital signs, those two or three key customer graphs that are segmented by our most important segmentation scheme. So rebuffering by region or rebuffering by client or rebuffering by CDN, all on the main page. The next level down, if we see a particular problem on uh, rebuffering by client, we can drill into level two. And at level two, that rebuffering by client we can add in more and more diagnostic information that may typically correlate with that customer impacting event. And finally, the third layer tends to get more system specific. So perhaps you've identified uh, maybe an issue with first byte latency coming off of your DRM servers. Well, that third layer can focus completely on the DRM servers and, focus and surface information that may indicate uh, performance issues with the servers themselves, CPU utilization or memory consumption, uh, very low level system metrics. And now that we've found these issues, uh, I wanted to, to end by talking about a, the typical areas where the most improvement can be had. And again, as I talked to our customers, they often started with the stream itself. That's the first best place to start. It ends up being a very big lever for improving the streaming experience for your customers. You can find these issues and see your improvements by focusing on rebuffering by video, and then simply by tuning your bit rate. If you have a single bit rate encoding, you can tune, off, tune and optimize what may be best for your viewers. So if your viewers aren't well connected, perhaps your bit rate's too large. And if you compare that back, ideally, without sacrificing video quality, you may be able to directly improve that rebuffering event. Of course, adaptive bit rate is a really great way to automatically balance and make that, or in a real-time fashion, make the trade-off between uh, rebuffering and video quality. And also, don't forget your encoding parameters. Uh, if you can find a way to just reduce the amount of bits that have to travel over the wire with a better encoding, that's a, a great way to minimize the risk to your customers and improve their download experience. 
Uh, and finally, of course, if you are working with larger, longer content, it may make sense to do more pre-buffering. Do more buffering up front, sacrifice that startup latency to protect that stream and ensure that it's uninterrupted. Tip number 11 is optimize your client. This is the, the second biggest lever for uh, kind of having permanent solutions and ensuring you're providing a good experience for your customer. Don't neglect all of the tuning parameters that are available to you, like the amount that you buffer, uh, the buffer sizes, and even play around with your buffer rate selection algorithms. In this category, we might also put sophisticated CDN selection algorithms. But, and finally, we get to number 12, which isn't a find and fix solution. I've learned that it's actually a lifestyle for any internet service provider and for video in particular. As I said, viewer networks do frequently get congested and finding those issues and understanding that it's the client network versus your infrastructure is the first clear step. Thereafter, oftentimes you'll have to partner with your CDN to come up with a solution. If you're using a multi-CDN solution, it may be possible to detect uh, a CDN that may be better at connecting into a particular viewer network, in which case you can simply shift traffic for that set of customers to the CDN that works best for them. If that's not the case, partnering with your CDN, you may be able to identify optimizations they can make on their side. Potentially sending them to a different edge location could work around some of that congestion or poor performance. And with that, we have 12 of the, talked about our 12 guidelines for improving customer experience for streaming video. As I said, it's important to ensure you start with the customer and understand what's important to them. Identify those two or three key customer metrics that, that your customers care about most. And thereafter, apply smart segmentation strategies that allow you to pinpoint and find the specific area that may be contributing to poor performance for the user. And that's it. Thank you very much. If you're interested in learning more, we do have a, a white paper that was uh, published by Frost and Sullivan and Dan Rayburn that talks about measuring CDN performance. It's pretty relevant to this topic area. Uh, and it goes a little bit deeper in CDN performance measurement methodologies and has lots of good data for you. So if you have that, where do we find it? OK, paper's available there. Thank you very much.